Hi, welcome to Can't Make This Up. My name's Kevin, I'm the host around here. Uh, If you're brand new to the podcast, welcome. Uh, This is a place where I get to sit down with historians and journalists and uh, independent authors and just chat about their latest research and the newest books they're putting out. Uh, If you've been listening for a while, uh, welcome back. Uh, It means a lot that you keep coming back and listening to to the content that I help create. Um, Please like and subscribe to this uh, so you can stay tuned when new episodes drop. And, uh, you know, feel free to tell a friend if you're really enjoying the show. Right now, it's mid-November when uh, I'm recording this. The election is behind us. Thank you, Jesus. Uh, We got the holidays. We got Thanksgiving and Christmas looking ahead. Uh, So it's a good time of year. And I'd like to share some news about the podcast, if I could. Uh, I think I've talked about this before. Uh, So for work, I have about an hour commute each way. Um, So that's, uh, you know, I spend a lot of time driving. It's like 10 hours a week. And the way I get through it is history podcasts, for one, uh, but also listening to audiobooks. And so I've discovered a new service called Libro.fm. It's an online subscription service where you get to, for $14.99 a month, uh, you get access to uh, one audiobook. You get a credit for an audiobook. uh, And then uh, you can purchase additional audiobooks if you want at a, I think it's a 30% discount. Uh, But the cool thing about Libro.fm is that they partner with independent bookstores so that a portion of whatever sales of audiobooks that you might make go to an independent bookstore of your choice. Uh, So that could be the bookstore just around the corner from you, or if you've been traveling and you found a really cool bookstore and you want to support them, uh, you can go find them on the list and you can send your proceeds to them. Uh, I think this is a really cool 21st century way for people to help keep the independent brick and mortar bookstores uh, thriving. Uh, because they are very important to our communities and to uh, and to reading in general. So uh, the podcast is partnered with Libro.fm. Uh, there is a link to Libro down in the description of this episode uh, in your podcast app. Uh, and if you join Libro, you will get, uh, following the link for the podcast, you'll get an additional audiobook for your first month. So that's two free audiobooks uh, to start. They've got a cool collection of over a quarter million books. Uh, I've been using it for a little while, and and I, and I like it so far. So uh, if you'd like a chance to check out Libro.fm, take a look down below. So that brings us to today's episode. My guest today is Steve Kemper. Uh, Steve is, he holds a PhD from the University of Connecticut. He teaches writing and journalism. He's a contributor for such publications as BBC Wildlife, Smithsonian Magazine, National Geographic, Uh, And he's written a number of books, and he joins us today to talk about his latest book, which just came out a couple days ago, uh, Our Man in Tokyo, The American Ambassador and the Countdown to Pearl Harbor. Uh, And this is about uh, Joseph Gru, who was the American diplomat stationed uh, in Tokyo from 1932 up until uh, World War II. And very interesting story. Uh, I learned a lot in in this interview and in in reading Steve's book, uh, something that I never really thought or or even really considered about, the the status of American diplomacy in Japan in those tumultuous tumultuous years leading up to Pearl Harbor and World War II. So I hope that you'll enjoy my conversation with Steve Kemper, uh, and I hope you'll learn a lot as well. The You Can't Make This Up History Podcast Bringing you strange but true things from the past It's not the average history that you learned in school We're bringing you the heroes and bringing you the fools And stories that are just too crazy to believe The stranger than fiction and super unique Steve Kemper, welcome to Can't Make This Up. Glad to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Tell us a, a little bit about yourself and your background. Well, um, uh, I've been a freelance journalist for about 40 years now. Um, and the last 
10 or 15 years of those have been as a book writer of history. Somehow I turned from journalism to writing books of history and I enjoy it very much. So that's been my last, those were my last three books, including this one that we're, we're going to talk about today. So what made you interested in this topic? Uh, what made you decide to look into uh, American ambassador in, in Japan? I read um, a book called In the Garden of Beasts by Eric Larson, which is about the American ambassador to Berlin in the early 1930s when Hitler and Nazism were just starting to make themselves felt in Germany. Mm -hmm. The book was fascinating, and uh, it made me wonder who was our man in Tokyo. And that's literally where it started. I looked it up, and it turned out to be Joseph Grew. And he had been there for 10 years, uh, the last 10 years before Pearl Harbor. He had kept a diary the entire time, 6,000 pages. I mean, this is, this is <laughs> for, for someone like that's me, a, it's like, are you kidding? This is, this is that's perfect. That's a gold mine. It's a gold mine. And his papers were at Harvard. And I live in Connecticut, so it wasn't tremendous distance to go. And there had not been a book about him when I started writing this since, well, been 50 years since since someone had written a biography of him. And it's a full biography, an academic biography. Excellent book, but not what I wanted to do. I write I write narrative history. Okay. So um, I dove in. That that's fantastic. That, so you're making a, a much more accessible account. I hope so. Uh, my my goal is to recreate what it was like to be in that embassy in his shoes during those 10 years. And so I, I draw heavily upon his diary, upon his letters, upon his dispatches, the dispatches to and from the State Department. Uh, news clippings, he kept, he had a clipping service and he kept, there's volumes and volumes of news clippings from papers in Japan, papers in the U.S. All of this is invaluable for, to give a contemporary feel to what I'm writing. So it's really almost a, it's not day by day, but it's certainly month by month account of what he was going through, what he was thinking, what he was uh, despairing about and, and uh, finding some optimism about until the bombs flew on Pearl Harbor. All right, well, let's start with uh, who was our man in Tokyo? Who, who was Joseph Grew? He was um, the, the child of Boston Brahmins, he grew up on Beacon Hill, which is the, the posh area of Boston. His family has been in America for a long time, one of those old New England families. They had a home in Manchester by the sea for the summer and, and a mansion for the winter. He went to Groton, was sent away to Groton and then to Harvard, like his father and like his brothers before him. And he wanted to his father wanted him to be, to go into Boston business or banking. That Those were the family pursuits, the only acceptable family pursuits. And Gru had no interest at all in, in those two things. And so his father was um, didn't know what to do with this young man. And so he said, I'll, I'll, I'll let you go away for a year and have get this adventurousness out of your system. And when you come back, you're going to work on Boston uh, State Street. So he went away and he was not interested in the normal tourist place. He, he did a rugged trip through uh, the Far East. And when he got back after having malaria and having gone on hunting expeditions and all kinds of things, um, he told his father, I'm still not going onto State Street. I want to go into the State Department. And so his father was now in despair and told him, well, I'm going to try to get you a job in publishing because at least you can do that here in Boston and it's it's semi respectable. That didn't work out. And so eventually he um, got a job at a poorly paid job as a private secretary to a diplomat in <clears throat> Egypt, in Cairo. And in those days, there, there were no professional diplomats. They were it was all patronage jobs. So you had to be wealthy to get one of these jobs. And that Wealth, as, as we know, is not necessarily a credential for competence, um, definitely not for diplomacy. Mm -hmm. uh, Gru was one of the people that, that helped bring in reforms to create a professional diplomatic service, the, the foreign service. I'm, I'm, getting, I'm kind of bouncing around here. 
but he was very deeply devoted to the idea of foreign service, to serving his country in foreign places, because it it would it matched up with his ideas about his obligations to his country and also his his desire for far off places. And boy, did he see them. He he had 14 posts and they were all over the world. Mexico, Mexico City, Berlin. Uh, he was he he closed down the, the US Embassy in Berlin during World War One, came home. He went, he was on the commission to the for the Treaty of Versailles after the war. Um, he be, he became ambassador to Denmark and Switzerland, and then was named ambassador to Turkey, which at that point was a pretty tricky post. Um, and he served there for a number of years. And then Japan invaded Manchuria uh, in 1931. And Herbert Hoover and his Secretary of State, Stimson, decided we need somebody to get into Japan who's competent and can turn this around because they were starting to get worried about Japan. And so they called up the their best man, Joseph Clark Grew, and sent him to Tokyo. So he's appointed in 1932. Uh, what kind of environment does he walk into? Well, it was a pretty... Uh, pretty dangerous environment. If you were a Japanese politician of a certain sort, They're, the militarists were starting to take over. They had, as I just mentioned, the uh, Kwantung Army, which was based in Manchuria, had invaded Manchuria without asking permission from the civilian government. They just did it because they wanted it. They wanted the coal there to uh, fuel their ambitions for war. They needed coal to build a war machine, and they wanted space for Japan's uh, bursting population to be able to expand. And when people opposed them, they tended to get assassinated, or there were at least attempted assassinations. So on his way to his post in Tokyo, he was riding the train across the country, our country, and the headline in Chicago announced that Japan's prime minister had been killed by a bunch of uh, young military officers. And that was the second prime minister who'd been killed, who'd been assassinated in, within 18 months. There had also been former cabinet members killed. There had been, uh, there was a businessman who led one of the Zaibatsu, that's the family owned giant conglomerates in, in Japan. One of them had been assassinated. So it was, uh, a place that was on the verge of, of anarchy and mayhem and militarism. And that's what Grew stepped into. And his instructions were get the Japanese out of Manchuria and get them back on the path that they've been on for quite a number of years as our strong ally. So that is a, a tall order, knowing that, that Japan is um, divided Oh, yeah, there are moderates in Japan uh, who they they want to keep Japan's face turned towards the West. That's where the the bulk of their trade comes from. It's where their imports, imports and exports of business connections, cultural connections. These were all very, very strong. The militarists um, and the nationalists wanted to turn away from the West. They They thought that the West... And the Western values had started to undermine and destroy Japanese tradition. And of course, this is also an excuse to uh, have these imperial ambitions in the name of the emperor, whom Japanese deified. He, he was considered a god, literally a god. And uh, so if you could do it in the name of the emperor, you were doing it for the sake of God. And that was a pretty, you know, pretty persuasive to a lot of people. So Gru went in there and he had to figure out as the ambassador, who's in power? Who is trying to get power? Who can help me persuade the, the, the people who are, who are going crazy here? Who can either uh, cut them off or persuade them to change their course? And it was very difficult to do because Japan's political system is incredibly complicated. The constitution made the emperor the spiritual leader of the company, of the country, the commander in chief of the country. Um, and he put him in charge of everything, except that he was a god. 
so that he couldn't make any decisions because he couldn't be held responsible for anything. So there's there's a slight dilemma. They also had a parliamentary democracy. So they had a, an upper and lower house. It was called the Diet, uh, House of Peers and, and the House of Commons. And those people were, the, the House of Commons were elected. Um, and yet they were losing they were losing control to the military who didn't have to answer to, to the parliament. They only had to answer to the emperor. So there was this contradiction built into uh, the Japanese system of government that eventually destroyed it. As Japan goes down this road and Gru is caught in the middle uh, of all of this, what is what can you tell us about the character of American Japanese relations uh, during the 1930s? Well, it as as I was mentioning before, it's it it was pretty good for for much of the 20s, and then in starting in the 30s, but then the depression hit, and it hit Japan very hard. The silk industry collapsed, and also, what happened is that a lot of countries in the West, which were its main trading partners, began putting tariffs on Japanese goods to protect their own industries so that they could recover from the Depression. And Japan essentially has very few natural resources. They depend extensively on selling their goods to other countries. If you put tariffs on those goods, you make it very hard for a country like Japan to survive. So there was a lot of economic desperation that was that was rising there um, as it was throughout many countries in our hemisphere and in Europe and in Asia. And the, the relationship, which had always been strong, as I said, started to uh, become a, a scapegoat that was useful for the nationalist and the militarist to uh, to use as a, you know, something to kick at and say we need to be independent. They they aren't taking care of us. They had a point. They aren't. They aren't. They don't care about us. We have to survive on our own. And to survive on our own, we may have to expand and take natural resources uh, where we need, where we can get them, because we otherwise we're going to shrivel into a second-rate power and pass away as a power as a as a power in Asia. And they were the power in Asia at this point. So Gru was his, his job was to rescue the relationship, to temper the militarism, and um, you know try to talk sense into into the, the people who wanted to destroy the relationship that had long uh, occurred between the U.S. and Japan. Um, can you tell us about some of uh, Gru's efforts to to do that? To, uh, in his words, work for peace to the end. Well, it what that involves, of course, if for an ambassador, is a lot of talking to the his his counterpart in Japan, the foreign minister, and trying and other uh, he has he has a staff in Tokyo, military staff and military attaché, commercial attaché, and uh, undersecretaries, whose job is to collect information military information, commercial information, uh, any kind of information that might help the U.S. understand what's happening in Japan and set policy toward Japan. So he has all these people working for him, and he's also dealing constantly with the foreign office. He's he's uh, saying, you know, if you what what you did in Manchuria has has alienated much of the world. Is that the way you want to approach diplomacy? Is that is that the reputation you want to have? He, so he tries to talk them into moderating what they're doing. And then as they start to infringe further into China, they don't stop in Manchuria. Oh, the Japanese were constantly saying, but you don't seem to understand what we're trying to do. We're just we're, we are doing all this for the sake of peace and survival. That's that's all we're interested in. We want peace in in Asia and we are bringing peace to Asia by uh using bullets to create it. So that discrepancy was something Gru had to try to get his mind around and work around. And it was, he he worked with I, I, the numbers in my book, but it was something like uh, 14 foreign, um, foreign office ministers 
during his time there because the cabinets kept falling. The, 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 military, the military people would get upset about something um, and the cabinet would fall because they, they had the secretary, they had the, the minister of war and they had the minister of the Navy. And they could at any moment, one of those people could resign and make the cabinet fall in order to get a new cabinet. They were constantly trying to get someone into the prime ministership who would support what they wanted to do, someone into the foreign office who would support what they wanted to do. And it was this relentless pressure from the right wing that Gru had to report to our government and also uh, try to understand who was going to be next and also try to work with whoever was in there to say, please uh, temper what you're doing and think about the consequences of it for, for your trade, for your relationships with other countries around the world, for uh, peace. Uh, it was, it was, he was a mouse on a wheel a lot of times. For a, for a profession that's built a lot on relationships, uh, having to deal with somebody new ever, every however many months uh, had to make his job so difficult. It would. It, it, I'm sure it did. He was a very gregarious, uh, open and friendly man. And the, the Japanese, uh, as anti-Americanism grew stronger and stronger in Japan during the 30s, they they didn't direct it towards Gru. They understood that Gru was trying to to see things from their point of view, was trying to uh, work for peace. That he wasn't uh, he 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 was very diplomatic <laughs> as his job required. He didn't make many statements in public at all uh, about what the Japanese were doing. This was all done behind closed doors, and it was uh, the, and the Japanese appreciated that. They appreciated his discretion, and so. Uh, even when they were attacking everybody under the sun uh, and all sorts of American systems and ideas, they very rarely attacked a group. And that led to some Americans thinking, well, what, why aren't they attacking him? He must be an appeaser. He must have gone native. And that really bothered Gru a lot. Of course it would, um, and especially since it was untrue. Um, to follow that a little bit further, the, the last thing I wanted to ask you was, you know, he's playing the role of mediator towards Japan, but he's also has to relay that back to the United States. So, so how does Washington respond to Gru's advice and, and some of his warnings? They appreciated him being there because he wasn't causing more trouble than, um, than they could handle, but they also tended not to take his suggestions and his advice as seriously as he would like them to take it. Um, they, they often ignored what he wrote. Uh, he often didn't know whether they had even read what he wrote because he didn't get a response. That was frustrating for him. Um, and he was also frustrated sometimes by their responses to events and circumstances in Japan when he had warned them, uh, maybe you shouldn't respond this way because this will happen. And then they proceeded, Hull and uh, Hornbeck, who was his, it was a Secretary of State, Cordell Hull, and his his chief advisor on the Far East, Stanley Hornbeck, often did exactly the opposite of what Gru had recommended that they do, which of course made Gru's job harder. And um, and he couldn't complain about it. He couldn't, he couldn't complain to to the Japanese because he was a he had he, he did not want to undercut his own government he was really devoted he was a devoted soldier he called himself um, for his government even when he disagreed with it and he couldn't complain much to to his his people in in Washington because it, clearly they hadn't taken his advice he, he persisted though he he kept offering his advice right up to the end about what he thought would help what he thought should be done, what he thought should should be avoided. Almost all of it was ignored. I think I think one of the things that might interest your readers, uh, your your listeners rather, the most, one aspect of of this history that fascinated me and that I hadn't known about was the attempt by the then Prime Minister of Japan. Prince Konye Fumamaro, 
to set up a secret meeting with President Roosevelt in the late summer, early fall of 1941, just a few months before Pearl Harbor, because Konya realized too late that he had gotten Japan into a, a, a tragic spiral. And so he told about this possibility that he would do anything, anything necessary, take any actions to prevent war if he could just meet face to face with FDR. And FDR agreed to do this, but Secretary of State Hull required all sorts of preconditions before he would encourage FDR to have to take this meeting. And Gru was, was always, for the rest of his life, dismayed by this because he thought what would have happened if Cornier and Roosevelt had met what 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 would have happened? We'll never know, but it's it's a very intriguing and, and for Gru anguishing question. That, 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 that is a very intriguing question. How how could things have been different? Yeah, it may not have made any difference at all. But um the the army and the navy were on board with the idea of, of these talks. They thought the talks would fail, but they were on board to do it. They were and keep in mind that. Prince, Prince Conier was a civilian. So they were allowing this civilian to do this. And it was, it was an incredible gesture. No, no prime minister had ever left Japan to, to meet a foreign leader ever. And certainly had not left Japan to meet a potential enemy. And he wanted to meet with FDR in American territory. So uh, it, was, it was an extraordinary offer. And the State Department for various reasons that I discuss in my book, killed it. Uh, didn't take advantage of it. Konya had no choice except to move ahead with the military's plans. In researching this, were you left with any impressions about the importance of diplomacy in geopolitics that might be useful today? Oh, that's a, that's a good question. And the answer, of, is, of course, is yes. Uh, it seems like the world could use a double heaping of diplomacy at this point. Diplomacy depends upon patience, compromise, personal relationships, the willingness to, to, to compromise, in, but with self-interest, with, with mutual self-interest that seems to, to be gone between not just countries, but uh, political opponents and I wish that people would um, recover some of the some of the virtues of diplomacy, including not using inflammatory language, not distorting the truth, not ignoring facts. Uh, all of these things have to be agreed upon, or diplomacy fails. And we're seeing failures all over the place: failures of failures of communication, failures of politics, failures of leadership. So. Um, yeah, I think a lot could be learned by looking at someone like Gru, whom uh, I came to regard as a kind of quiet hero. He, uh, you know, he, he didn't want to make headlines. He wanted to to conduct his his business in such a way that problems never reached the headlines. And uh, I think that was <laughs> that's contrary to the spirit of our times. Uh, well, Steve, um, I really appreciate you taking the time to talk to us about this. I've I've learned a lot um, about the state of Japan and our relationship with Japan uh, prior to World War II. Um, if a listener wants to learn more about uh, Joseph Guru and get an on-the-ground view of these events, uh, where can they pick up a copy of your book? Uh, I think it should be available just about any place books are sold online or in your, your local bookstore or your library. Okay. And if people want to learn more about you and, and some of your other work, uh, do you happen to have a website? I do. It's stevekemper.net. All right. Well, uh, the book again is Our Man in Tokyo, an American Ambassador and the Countdown to Pearl Harbor. Uh, Steve Kemper, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us. Thank you for hosting me. 
Thank you for listening to another episode of Can't Make This Up. I, I hope that you enjoyed my conversation with Steve Kemper and were able to learn uh, a lot about the state of American diplomacy uh, prior to World War II. Um, and we're able to take some lessons uh, that might be applicable uh, for today's foreign policy. Um, big thank you to Steve for taking the time to talk to me and share his research. Uh, if you are interested in this topic and want to learn more uh, about Joseph Grew, uh, and you want to pick up a copy of Our Man in Tokyo, uh, I have a link for it down in the description of this episode in your podcast app. Uh, that link will take you to a site called IndieBound.org. That'll connect you with a local bookseller in your area. Uh, and then there's also a link to the audiobook version on Libro.fm if uh, that's something that interests you uh, as a way to listen to uh, Our Man in Tokyo on the go. Uh, looking ahead, got some exciting irons in the fire. Um, got an interview scheduled with a uh, husband-wife pair of Egyptologists. We're going to talk about the uh, reign of Akhenaten uh, and Nefertiti. I'm really excited about that. Also, I uh, am going to be having a conversation uh, about spies during the American Civil War. Uh, I think that's going to be a lot of fun. And then there's one other... Uh, guest on the horizon that I can't say exactly who it is yet, but it's a pretty, uh, pretty big name uh, in popular history. Uh, you may have recognized his name. Uh, he's um, releasing his first historical fiction novel. So really hoping to have this gentleman on the podcast. Just got a, a couple more things to confirm that, but it's looking pretty good. Uh, so when that uh, we finally finalize that, I'm cannot wait to share it with you guys. Uh, so until then, uh, I hope that you have a, a great rest of November uh, and a happy Thanksgiving. Um, till next time.